as we get to, before we get to Marysville, I think it's important, but we'll get everybody in here. This is great. Come on in. Not movable. I think it was important because when we're discussing things like this, a lot of the things that happen, they're objective. You see them. Something happens. Something happens that I can come and talk to you about. But you always got to worry about who's, who's talking about it. A lot of things go through your mind and they, they turn out to be a little bit more subjective than you want, so you don't know what's going on. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about me so you can understand the context where I came from. I can't explain myself after the Marysville come out. About 1995, I think I fell into an alternate universe. My life path went so far off course, I don't even know what was happening. But boy, I love Montana. And I kept myself amused and I kept myself interested. Just wonder, it's just so wondrous up here that now, what? I'm 60, nah, what is that, Earth years? Come on. I just don't understand that, how that works out. Um, but I can't really be well-defined for that. All right, this is actually my debut presentation here, so I think we're going to do okay. Bear with me. I'm forgetting something. Just a second. Got some notes here. Greet audience. I did that. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank audience and host, really, for coming out here. I'm... People have things. I yammer all the time. I can't believe I'm actually got a reason to do it. Oh, yeah. A quick visual check of any suspicious concentrations of tomatoes or cabbage within throwing range. No, all right. If okay, continue. No, really, because of the 60s thing, I've had some mileage over the years. Um, we all remember that King Kong scene where... King Kong breaks through his chains on stage in the New York theater. People start running for the doors. I've had that happen to me before. <laughs> when I was up at, um, uh, on the Blackfeet Reservation, I was delayed up at the park for a while. I was just playing around up there, and I worked with a bunch of Blackfeet, and I asked them, hey, can I have an Indian name? Where do you sign up for that? You got an application for it or something? <laughs> Apparently that has... Uh, it's like an invitation to the tribe, so they took that a little bit uh, serious with that. It, I, you can't just sign up for it or ask it. But they looked at me for a while, and they thought about it, and they decided, for you, we're going to make an exception. Your Indian name is now Skeletor. <laughs> Skeletor? I, I don't think that's very pecuni, but what can you say on that one? All right, so I try to keep an open mind. I don't know if it's God, God's middle management, people that, it, that I'm convinced he has, or a thousand other things. After researching everything, watching TV shows about it, I'm convinced it's like USOs, UFOs. There's no one unified theory. You don't just die and become a ghost. You hear poltergeist activity, this happens, B happens, C happens, and everything. There may be something different in each one. We may be bringing them out on our own mind with our own energy, uh, it might be a recording in the background, radiation that they say. All the thousands of other theories. I don't know that. And that characterizes Marysville, too, because there's, oh boy, I mean, it's, it's every range of it. I'll throw, in, I'll throw in one Marysville one. Can everybody hear me, by the way? I'm always being told to settle down. Shut up, you're, you're too loud. So with this microphone, I'm worried about it. This isn't quite in Marysville. This is called the Angry Hag of Deadwood Gulch. I think it's at Deadwood Creek, I think it is. And this is a story I heard from a lady. I'm going to call her Mrs. O because I did not get permission to speak about this or that I'll speak about it in public. And um, she's familiar with the Marysville area. Her daughter used to live there for a while. She may have as well. Again, you people may know these people, may know more than I do. Uh, but she told me about this uh, incident where they bought a uh, cabin at, um, on Deadwood Creek. And it's... You may even know where it is. Supposedly, it's a little bit west of Marysville, and it's way back there in the woods, four service road, no other cabins, nobody else around, no trails, so there shouldn't be lights or anything of that nature. Well, she was in there with her husband, and one dark, scary night, of course, and she was in another room of the cabin, the bedroom of it, and she said that she was, she was about ready to go to sleep where she noticed that there was this light in the room. It was kind of a fuzzy light, so she looked over, and 10 feet away from her was, as she described it, 
a lady, an old lady in a ragged dress, ragged hair that was really long, mean. She could see that she was mean. And she was doing this, just cussing up a storm. I, did, I didn't clarify what she was saying. or anything, but she, ah! And she went from one end of the room where these old beds were to another room three times, which is an incredible long time when you hear about ghost stories that these things happen. And Mrs. O was really worried about, uh, she wanted to get another look at this thing. Her glasses were right over there on the counter. But she was worried that the act of her grabbing them would be enough to attract this ghost because it was so real, absolutely so real. And even though she didn't have her glasses on, she was able to describe her dress, her hair, her attitude, and everything. So when you think again, I'm not really getting into the theory of it, but then when you think, what the heck's going on? Um, maybe this is a reflection from the past, but the angry hag of Deadwood Creek. I mean, that's just, uh, that's just like a gift if you're doing a presentation or anything. She might have been a very nice lady, a very nice lady. Maybe she was just mad because for the 15th time, everybody's going down to the saloon. And she's left there with the kids, and she's trying to get some Castoria into them. So you never know. All right, before Marysville now, I've had, my theory is other forces at work. I've had such bizarre things happen. I didn't know if I was blessed or I was cursed. I came up to it now that I'm still alive. I call this the Kramer effect. We all know Kramer from the Seinfeld comedy. Uh, whatever cosmic comedy we're in, I think I might have a role in it. Not a starring role, but a repeating one. Because I'll never be the star, and I'll never get to be the big thing, but all these bizarre things happen to keep you going. I think a lot of people have seen that in their life. Let me demonstrate this, because before I came up here, the only paranorma, paranormal really events that I think I could see was I uh, was walking through my my um, living room when I was six years old to get uh, asthma medication. Coming back through the uh, living room, the sofa, someone sat on the sofa and nobody was there. It was a very distinctive old sofa, so you hear the crunch. Looked over there, there was definitely, as far as I remember now, something sitting there. Eh, I don't know what that. I took my bike, drove it right through a plate glass window of a shoe repair shop in Kansas City. And got out okay. I don't know how that happened. And they even proved this on myth, myth Busters that it's supposed to be impossible. So I knew all this weird stuff would happen. So now I come up to Montana. And I got to throw this in because it, it, defines, it, it, it defines the fact that none of this is defined. But there are other things going on uh, around out here. I'm working at St. Peter's. I have a cabin up at uh, Flesher Pass. And this is just fantastic. Boy, every ride in is a destination vacation. I loved it to death. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with the Canyon Creek area. Uh, Canyon Creek is on a little dog leg, a little couple sh sharp curves, and they're really sharp curves. I'm coming down from um, Flesher Pass to do an evening shift, and as I pass that curve, I notice there are five or six chickens that are just pecking around at the end of a ranch access. I like chickens, and I just... Boy, I hope nothing happens to them. They're kind of close to the road. Just completely ridiculous. After my shift at work, I'm driving an old Subaru and start it up, and something's wrong with it. It's, it just doesn't seem right. I'm not a mechanic, but I go check all the wires. I don't see what's going on. Oh, wait. I just that day had to get one of those giant batteries for a big, giant mega light. Brand new one. So, all right, I can look at it with my flashlight. Put that light in there. It's not working. What? All right. No, straps. Okay. Ah, throw it in the car, and by the street lights, I just messed with the uh, cables, and it seemed to run. This, this, this does connect. So what is it? About 11 o'clock, close to midnight, I'm coming back home, and I'm approaching this curve again, and I just think about the chickens. And I, oh, I hope nothing happened to those chickens. I turn on my brights, and... Sure enough, there were a couple chickens had gotten hit. I don't like to see that. It just made me feel sad about it. And I was grown, raised a Catholic, and I just automatically, like you did, oh, you know, peace of their souls, and I made the sign of the cross. But as soon as I completed the sign of the cross, that light burst on, bright, strong, white light, almost blinded me. I almost went right through that curve. So was that God acknowledging? If he does that, why does he try to kill you off? I don't understand. The last thing I'll, I'll tell you real quick about what I saw before, 
Uh, I was up at Glacier Park one time, and I was very, very depressed, which is unlike me. Usually, yeah, things happen, but I, I shrug them off. I couldn't break this depression. Um, a friend of mine was watching caretaking Lake McDonald, so they threw me in cabin nine. It's one of the guest cabins there at the lake. This is during the wintertime, so nobody's there. And just dragged out some, a mattress, slept on it. And my memory of it now is that I woke up in the middle of the night, three o'clock, whatever, facing the wall, and I see a glow on the wall. I turn over, and the only way I can describe it were four, it was actually two a pair, because there were four figures that were standing at my bed, and they were nothing but black outlines with a glowing aura to them. Boy, this sounds really weird when I'm saying it, too, I suppose, to the, but that's all I can say. And my impression now, after I think about it, is that one of them was talking to the other or, and the entire impression, very strong I got, was, look at this idiot. He's upset about this. My God, he's only 35. He's got all his life. He's worried about this lady. Blah, blah, blah. You're an idiot to continue doing that. And that's my last thought. I wake up. Oh, it's sunshine. And then I remember that and went running out of there and... Oh, well, look what happened, all that. And it was in the afternoon, I realized the depression's gone. I think it was my grandmother. I have a really happy grandmother. Grandpa wasn't too happy, but that kind of describes the aura. But I think they did and switched that. And something like that happened. The only problem with it is that um, if I saw that, if I really woke up and saw black figures, boom, it'd be like the Looney Tunes where you see a perfect profile of somebody running through a wall. I can't reconcile that, so I don't know. All right, let's get, let's get to Montana here. All right. What is going on out there? Like I said, probably at thousands of things. The scary things happened in, Mar in Marysville and kind of accumulated on that. Um, but while I was at the hospital, some weird things happened. We're, we're all associated with hospitals. So I got to throw you a couple hospital stories there, and then we'll get to Montana. Um, this is, comes from a very trusted surgical floor nurse that I would step in front of a bus for if she was in danger. I trust her utterly. She floated over to medical floor at this time. This is in the mid-90s. And uh, medical floor was taking care of a lady from the nursing home, palliative care. She was at the edge of death, and they wanted her there to give her some good medications, things of that nature, so she's comfortable. She hasn't spoke for months. She, she wasn't conscious. They were just making her comfortable. So the nurse goes in there to check her IV, and they're looking at the IV. This is how she describes it. She's like checking the rate, and then suddenly, giant hand looks up, and the lady has this talon hands on her, gripping her, sitting up in bed, looking right at her, and in a middle European accent is saying, don't let me die. Don't let me die. She went running out of there. Uh, pause for somebody to ask if they let her die or not. <laughs> I'll let you go with that. They kept her comfortable, but she did pass away that night. But so, I mean, something's going on out there. I was working surgical floor too, and I kept getting these strange phone calls D19, surgical floor, D19, D19, a woman's voice. She sounded like she was in distress. And that went on for like a month. Couldn't figure it out. I'm going down to the cafeteria, and I'm down the basement. This is in the 1800s before it looks like the International Airport it does today. And I say, oh, hey, these doors, they're labeled. They're labeled. Oh, D13, oh, D14, D19. That was the morgue. Uh -huh. All right. And then a housekeeper later told me that that was her messing with me. But it still <laughs> happened to me. All right, now Marysville. I'll get to this. We don't have a clock here. I've got to watch out so I'm not babbling too much. Oh, my, I want to make sure i got enough material, though, too. Okay, excuse me as I squint at this. All right, let me throw one story at you because I got you a company, and then we'll go to Marysville. And this is more to define that there may be some kind of force around me. I may not be the best judge of what's happening. I can only witness. Um, Kansas City, I come back from Montana after... A, Another girlfriend that didn't work out. I'm working at the High Regency Hotel downtown. It's a big, giant hotel. 
And um, they had a cafeteria in there where they allowed the police officers and uh, other civil workers to come in, fire department, things of that nature. Very large cafeteria, and we're in those little lines, you've seen them, they got the little poles like that. And uh, I had just come back from Montana after another nightmare that I won't get into. I didn't have any money. I got a ticket for um, not having registration or something in my car. But I was walking at the time. I didn't have any problem. But I hadn't paid this off. And I was really paranoid about it because I get to the cafeteria, and then here's this uh, giant two Metro Kansas City Police Department officers right there. I'm tall, but I'm really wiry. And then you see the real guys who are big and all that leather and everything. I mean, all right, just be cool, just be cool, just, just be careful. They don't know whether you got a ticket or not. Low profile. I'm just sitting there, and the one looks over and says, how you doing? Oh, yeah. Hi, how you doing? I kind of lean nonchalantly back on the rail, and the rail goes up. And next thing I know, my foot is caught in that guy's holster. And the other, and he's going for your gun. What are you doing? What are you doing? Try to keep a low profile. Don't bother me. Okay, this is great. <laughs> Julian House. I called Julian House because after this incident, I found out who lived there. Some of you people may still know this family. Um, originally, it was Louis E. and Anna Julian. They came over here from Sweden in 1880. And that has been uh, documented and all that. Um, they had a store in Silver City for about four years, and then they came up to Marysville because Marysville was burgeoning so much. And this was their original cabin, as far as I can understand. I have mentioned that at one time they had a cabin that burned, and they either rebuilt it. So, again, I'm not too sure, but uh, as far as I know, this dates to about 1880. Um, just one room cabin here, as you can see. And then they started adding all this other stuff in here. Uh, in the back, they added on another bedroom, things like this. Uh, so I'm up in Marysville, and I'm, I'm down the street renting a, renting a house. And I get to notice, hey, thanks for fixing up the house. You got 30 days to move. <laughs> Damn. Rentals are not that many in... Marysville. There's only like 80 people there at about 20 occupied houses. Uh, but fortunately, a gentleman had just built a house, and he was staying in this one, and they started to move. And they said, hey, go in that one, the same week that it opened. I'm dragging stuff up. It was only 500 yards, too. It was a great move. Dragging stuff up the hill and throwing it in there. A neighbor comes over, Ginny Thomas. Um, she's a very nice lady. I trust her, again, for anything. Her family's been up there forever as well her husband as well, and she casually walks by, and I get the, do you know that this is one of the most haunted houses in Marysville? And I said, no, that wasn't in the brochure. <laughs> there actually wasn't a brochure. I never had a lease yet. It's like, you want a house, got a house. Here's the thing. Fantastic people up there. All right, I, I mean, I saw it from the outside. It looks like Jed Clampett's cabin, doesn't it? But it was, it was fantastic. So the main house, this is probably useless because it's so small. Um, was, what's key to it is that this is the, this is the old cabin right there. Uh, got a big giant room. That was the original cabin with a wood stove. And then there's a kitchen, big kitchen there. And then on the side of the kitchen is this dog leg hallway, which I called the dark hall because it was dark and scary in there. And there's this dark hall here. And... Um, it had the original timbers from the original log cabin, the hand-hewn timbers, the Pioneer Helen Independent insulation from, 19, I think, 1894, 1892 that was still on there. Along this dark hall, too, including this room right here, I call this the Pioneer Room. Um, the, other ho the, the rooms on the other s were just abandoned. It's like you rent this house, and then you go in this hall. What's, what's going on? And there are three rooms that are abandoned. One was an abandoned bathroom. I push the door open, and the floors crash down. But there's a cabinet there, and there is 1930s razors, it, just like they put it down there and left it there. Mrs. Stewart's bluing and all these cobwebs. They, they just abandoned it. It was just amazing. Um, this room I called the Pioneer Room. This is just an example. I walk in there, and there's just like a pile of newspapers like this. This is 19... 1934, and I just look, 
Oh, what's this? Uh, oh, Chicago Raid in Search of Dillinger Brings No Trace. <laughs> and then they got this great one. They uh, kicked out Mae West's blonde portrayal of Lady Lou in the film She Done Him Wrong from Vienna and banned her. Why? Because it was, quote, nothing but uncouth and clumsy eroticism appealing to the basest instincts. She probably get an Emmy today. Right, so I'm right in this house, and I hear that it's supposed to be haunted. Okay, what, what do you mean by haunted? Because there's all kinds of haunted. You're like, can you clarify? She went right on the story. Everybody knows this stuff except me. Um, the story is, is that this was purchased by a gentleman who, lived, who moved to Missouri a couple years before me. He lived there a couple years and had renters, and he noticed this, and as well as the renters, two renters left that in the middle of the night you would hear loud noises, crashings and bangings, enough that they scared him off. And the owner brought in a Native American shaman to do the sage ceremony, and that got rid of all the spirits, according to what they said. I said, all right. Oh, yeah, that's right, there's something else. What? There's a spooky mirror in there, a mirror that they saw strange things in it. And even, even I talked to the owner, well, what do you mean by strange things? Strange things. Mostly people would see lights, like firefly lights, in this mirror. And the mirror ended up to be about maybe this big. The mirror was in the dark hall, on a shelf, jammed against the timbers, painted in there. You could tell it had been in there for a long time. All right, that's great. All right, uh, haunted house, it's all right. Ah, forget about it. I was in there for about three months because it was the end of January or something. I, everybody can still hear me. Still like this. What was key, too, is that I was hosting two dogs for the night. Marilyn Melton, if you know her, her family's been up there forever. Her mother used to be the postmaster. Um, she's got these two big dogs that would wander around. I'm a big dog person. I let them in. They became my friends. They'll spend half the night or something, and they were in that night. Doesn't matter what kind of dogs they were, but one was a Basset Hound German Shepherd Cross. <laughs> I swear this is genetically possible and on display on Aspen Street. <laughs> Great, Princess Jasmine. All, all right, so just past this into the new area, there's a li living room or den area, and I had a sofa there. I didn't have my bed yet. Uh, it's just like right behind this room, a little half wall. It's like I'm laying right here in a sofa, and the kitchen's right here, and then the dark hall goes this way. All right, I sleep, I sleep like a rock. Everybody is familiar with their sleeping patterns, too. If you wake up in the middle of the night, if you're not used to that, you know that, well, I don't usually do this. Did something, you look around to see if something woke you up. That's common to everybody. Um, and I'm serious about this, too, in Glacier, I was living in an RV right next to the, what, Trails End Saloon over there in East Glacier, the only saloon within the county. I got on the bad side of some lady, and she went into the bar the next day and fired up a bunch of buddies to come over and kill me, drag me out of my camper and kill me. That was a story. I didn't hear any of this. I wake up, and I come out. I was working on the motel right there on, on the property, and I come out of my motorhome, and there's two U.S. Marshals sitting there. Are you all right? Yeah, are you all right? And then I hear the story about how this crowd came over. It was a 70s, 1970s motorhomes uh, with the push button. Hand. They were grabbing that handle. They were doing this. They were kicking at the doors. They were trying to pry open the back door, trying to get to me. I didn't hear any of it. So I think a lot of stuff may have happened that I didn't see. But this night, this night, I wake up. I assume it's about 3 o'clock. That's just how it feels, and that's what's popular for this. All right, I, I remember get, I'm sleeping on the, on the sofa. My head's aiming towards the back of the house. And I looked up because that, even, even that was unprecedented. You wake up, uh, uh, turn around, that's all right. But why am I looking around? Then I noticed that the two dogs, they are uh, laying down with both their heads up and they're looking into the old, old end of the house. Just looking like they're looking. And that is unlike them too. It's like they're looking at something. I just went right over there as, remember looking, what's going on? And no more than that. All right, people describe this stuff. 
the story gets bigger every time you tell it. I try not to do that because this is so shocking. What happened next, best described, it, it wasn't a crash of kitchen items, it was an avalanche. The kitchen I had, basic kitchen, it had a sink, it had three cabinets above it, another set of cabinets over here. And it literally sounded, I would testify in a court of law that every cabinet door flew open at once, including the bottom ones. Every dish, every pan, every utensil, everything that was in there crashed to the sh floor at once. One giant that crashed, crashed, crashed. Wow, what was that? I, I was so tired. This is so amazing. And, and I'm grateful for it, that I literally thought I was responsible for that. I have, I have been my old worst enemy. For, I could do an entire presentation on how I goofed up myself from putting things wrong. I had a top-heavy lamp on top of a microwave at the time. And that might have fallen, but if it did, then it took like the entire kitchen with it. But I was so groggy that, wow, what happened? I really outdid myself that time. Oh, I'll just worry about in the morning, turned over to go to sleep. And just at that moment, I also describe it of, this is, this is exactly how I visualize it, Dwayne Johnson, the rock, like that guy. All right, here's Dwayne Johnson. He's got an armload of lumber. He suddenly materializes in the house and makes a running leap, jumps at the main house beam, and releases all this lumber. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, man, I really, really outdid myself. I'll screw around with it in the morning. I've really talked to myself, had a lot of heart-to-hearts to this, because literally, if I would have recognized it for what it was, or even remembered that that was the exact thing that people were telling, I would have been out of there in a heartbeat. I wouldn't be talking here. I'm not Zach Baggins. I don't look for this. I would have been out in a heartbeat. Okay, you can, you can understand what happened next. I wake up. Oh, I got the whole house to clean up. Not a thing is out of place. Nothing. Okay, um, uh, but, oh wait, just, just like what they said. Still, nah, it can't be right. I, when, when I was up in Flesher Pass, I saw a wildfire. No, it was a cloud. Uh, sorry, I just moved up here from Kansas. All right, sir, we'll take care of it. Grouse, I'm not a hunter, but grouse do that little mating call. For three years, my first three years when I walked out in the woods, I thought I had a dissecting aortic aneurysm. <laughs> I thought, oh, it's starting to split now. Oh, it didn't do it there. And I'm working at the hospital, and I'm too scared to ask anybody. So did I just see a poltergeist, or did something else happen? What's well, easier to believe? However, you know in your heart, when you describe this to some other people, you know in your heart when they say, well, were you sleeping? Was it a dream? Enough of that stuff. You know whether it was a dream or not. And this was a sequence of events. Oh, my God, and it was just like the, what they reported. All right, now, what's the next step? I was kind of anxious for it now because it was daylight and nothing happened that night. Got my camera ready. Don't really have anything. Made sure I had the dogs with me all the time so I wasn't scared. And wait for the next thing to happen. And nothing happens. And I call up the neighbors. I'm telling them all about this. And this is great. The neighbors are like, like Andy Phillips next to him. He goes, I told you. Or Harry McGee next door. Hey, Kathy, how are you? Hey, we know about that. It's no big deal. We told you about it. All right, so next step was, was this mirror. What's about this mirror? I want to see these lights in this mirror. But this mirror is in a dark hall. I'm not going in there at night. Literally, I do not go in there at night. It was too scary. So, hey, let's take the mirror out. Put it in the kitchen. If there's something there, I think I can deal with it. It was about maybe this high on this shelf. As I mentioned, it was definitely in there for decades. Layers of paint, cobwebs, all this stuff. All right. Well, you're coming out, baby. I'm getting out there to get a chisel, flamethrower, and all this. And it was very heavy. Oh, I should face the audience. <laughs> I'm getting off the... It was about this high, and when I brought it off, it was unexpectedly heavy because it was a solid glass mirror. And I went with the weight, and as I caught the weight, all these papers, hidden for decades, soot covered, dust covered, went fluttering all over. What the heck is this? What were those? Here's an example of what was in there. 
These are big mysteries. I found these hidden pioneer se secrets, these, this cache of personal papers. What does it mean? It must have something to do with the, with the haunting, blah, blah, blah. This is one of the most striking pieces. This is a picture. I'll leave these here if you want to look at it closer. It's a picture of the grab-all vein section of the Gould Mine. And that's one of the mines up there in the, in the Marysville district. Uh, there's absolutely no treasure mark. Nothing that I can find that's significant at all to the family. Julian's probably did have some, some things in there. All right, what else was found in there? Shoe sole, 1931 shoe repair. It's mostly like goop. I wish I had this stuff now. Remember, none genuine without our trademark, Xanol. All right, that's worthwhile hidden. There's a big, huge list of things. I won't go through them all, but here, here's, here's an example of them. A couple 1930 receipts from Helena Market where David A. Julian bought some food. The Julians here, Louis and Anna, they came here from 1880. Then they had, I cannot keep track of the generations because there was a David A. Julian Sr., David A. Julian Jr., and some of them went by Arthur. But David Julian, about the 30s, that's where all these letters were. Uh, one was an introduction to the Masons, is we are accepting you into the Masons. Well, this is rather important. I hope the Masons don't kill me because I found some document that I probably wasn't supposed to read. More grocery receipts. And then a letter from 1929. Um, Anna Julian, who lived in Helena, was, was sending back $6.50 back home because the mother covered for Ed at the pool hall. Six fifty. It's three hundred dollars now, but I know that doesn't convert right. So maybe that was. But okay, what is this? You go through all that, and there were there were things like receipts. It was nothing that was significant, nothing that I could see that had anything to do with it or why you would hide it, except for this one. I'm going to pass along the ex actual document, and I can get a picture of it on screen. I just want people to hold this and look at this. This was stuck in there, and without context, you can't tell what the heck. Is it meaningless? Is it not? And where are you? You're the last one. There's an envelope flap, of course, and it doesn't really describe it here, but someone you could tell jammed it with a pencil. I mean, just jammed it on there. And I had other people look and held up to the light, and they finally figured out, yeah, nobody's sweetheart now. Well, well, that's weird, and it's not a note. It's not a grocery item. Maybe it, It's weird, but without context, maybe it is some, maybe it's not. So what do you do after that? I did realize that I had to get these back to the family because here's a picture of the, of the Julians as well. This is, a, this is in Earl Fred's book. Marysville, it's history and it's people. This is undated. They also have a copy of it in the museum. Uh, nothing's cataloged. Nothing's indexed. There's a lot of work that needs to be done up there. Um, also, the fires took away a lot. This is the Julian family. This is uh, Anna, who bailed out the... Her son, this is David A. Julian. I think this is the David A. that we're talking about here. That may have gone by Arthur before. This guy right here. They don't know who he is. Because, but, man, you look at those noses. He's got to be there. This is Ed. This is the guy who owed the 650. That's right, Ed. Did you think that 130 years later we're going to talk about your pool hole? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, th that's striking. That, that really is striking, and it's... Embarrassing, humbling in a way. All right, so none of this is, seems meaningless. And my Indiana Jones, all right, I found a treasure of Walmart receipts and weird letters, so what does it mean? I did know that I had to find, find the family because it may be meaningless to me, but if you had a grocery receipt from your great-grandfathers or something, it's, it's, it's family history. My, my grandfather signed that, so it's different. So I knew that, well, whatever this is, I've got to get it to the family.
Another context and interlude here when it comes to finding things. Um, I came up here to Montana and I left to do some stuff and I came screaming back. This is in 1988. Found an old, uh, found a house to rent out in Clancy. Just this, this little small cabin. I didn't know anybody. Again, Montana to me, even walking to the capital is still fantastic to me. So I would just, eh, just wander the hillsides. I had no idea where I was. Somewhere up above Clancy. And it starts to rain. Oh, no. And, oh, here's this beat-up old chicken coop. I don't know, a shed. And it was half buried into the ground. I could only get into it about that big. And there was only a little area that I could shelter myself. But it was something. I didn't bring a hat. So I'm in there. I'm sitting in there. All right, it rains all. Oh, what's this? It was a cardboard box, and it was so buried by debris that I could barely see the top of it. Maybe, th maybe an inch or two was showing up. Slope of debris, rat nests, and everything. But I noticed the, these wires or something. What, what, what is this? Holy moly! What they were were steno book, steno books. They were only about this big, and this box was stuffed, stuffed with these steno books. Well, this is odd. Someone's got a huge record here. I pull it up. I look at it. This is someone's diaries. What are they doing here rotting away? I had just moved to Montana, like I said, back. I was working at the magazine up here. I was just a word processor. Grand. I had no idea what was going on. I was just kind of figuring out what was. Oh, there's history here. Uh -huh. and by that time, it was like, oh, this might mean something. So I grab this box, get my old car, drag it up there, throw it in there, and I get home. Oh, I got to get to work at the hospital at 3. Oh, I better get going. Well, let me look at this. Pull it out, and sure enough, and they were, they were handwritten diaries. And um, I couldn't find a name or anything. And it, Oh, wait. Um, there was a family album underneath it. Look it up. I was born under the gates of the mountains in, I forgot my notes, but 1892, I think it was. What is this? What this turned out, this was the family album of Florence Lake Hilger, of the Hilger Ranch here, who helped establish it. And I'm way over in Monta uh, Montana City or Clancy or wherever I was, and I, Hilger, Hilger, I know that name. Where Hilger, Hilger? Oh my God, that was the ones up there. This has got to be, whether, whether it's Joe Smith doesn't care, this is important, but this might have some extra ones. I will ask them at the Historical Society. And look again, and there was another book, and it was a signed book for uh, Florence's husband's uh, funeral. Florence Lake was the only one of the Hilder sisters, to, I, to my knowledge, that got married. And that's why she had the lake. And um, boy, the Hilder there, her aunt was uh, Fanny Sperry Steele, the rodeo uh, maven there. That was with Wild, Wild Bill's Wild West show and everything. All right, so I grabbed this stuff. Oh, this is important. And there were some four or five watercolors. Well, all right, that's it. Gotta go to work. Gotta go to work. All right, I'm on surgical floor. I'm more or less the clerk for surgical floor. You do everything for the patients, diets, all the lab, everything. So the first thing you do is you print out a patient's, the list of the patient's census, who's in there. All right, didn't do. All right, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm late. I had some weird things. And tape it in there, looking down there. No way. No way. Florence's sister had just been admitted. I can't remember which sister it is. Some of you may know the family. It began with a D. This is in 1990s, early 90s, 92. So well, this is incredible. So I go in there, but she was too ill to speak to me. And it wasn't hospital-oriented, so I waited until I had to check the diet when the family was in there, so I had a reason to come into the, into the room. They're very careful about that patient's privacy. And I, a bunch of family there. I don't know who it was, if it was anybody out here. Thank you very much. But hey, uh, hi there. I, I just told them I found a bunch of stuff that belonged to Florence Lake Hilger. And they said, oh, she's the daughter. She's the only one who got married and told me about it. And I said, well, I really should give this back to you or something. Uh, I didn't expect to, to meet the family or anything. And they said, oh, hell, do it yourself, dude. <laughs> do this. She's like 30 yards that way. She was in Cooney Nursing Home right next to uh, the hospital. So I go up there, grab all this stuff next day or so, and you, you can imagine this. Boy, it still kills me to 
think about this because it was definitely a highway to heaven episode. I don't live the Hallmark Channel, but my God, I certainly had a role there. Come into the nursing home. Hi, uh, you, is Florence Blake Hills here? Oh, yeah, uh, they're eating. That's her over there. I could see into the dining room. She was kind of big. She's about as tall as I was, too, and she looked like she was with it and she was active and everything. She got with her dinner, was trucking back. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, what do you want? Uh, you don't know me or anything, but uh, want your stuff back? Wow. I mean, we were crying there. It turned out that uh, she said that when she got into the nursing home, all her possessions just got spread to the winds. And she said that was the number one thing she wanted back because that funeral book was the only thing she had left of her husband. Those watercolors were the only watercolors she did. And she was hoping to see him again one day. And everything else was just a godsend to her. And it, it scared the hell out of me. Well, okay, all right, okay, we're done here now. Great lady, I'm glad I was able to meet her. And my memory is, and I just checked before I came here, and I think it's the same year. My memory is that I went back a month later, and it was the class, I come in, she's not there. Her bed's made, her watercolors are up on her bed, and she'd passed away that day. That's why, with this ghost and everything, there's lots of things going on. It literally might be God or angels or something like that. Well, go, let me get back to Marysville. But when things like that happen to you, that affects exactly what I'm finding here. Was I, am I being used as some kind of cosmic UPS agent? I, I'll deal with that. That's all right. I can deal with it. And when you hand these things back to those people, man, I mean, okay. I can die now happy. I did something right in the midst of all the bad I did. I mean, you see those people's eyes and you know. All right, so now I'm, I'm back here in Marysville with all these papers. Timing okay? All right, we're doing well. So I have all these papers. All right, I got to find, I get on the net, and we all know what the net is. It sends you everywhere and then sends you nowhere. It seemed to me I looked in the phone book, and there might have been a Julian, but they didn't know who I was talking about. Either way, about a week of looking around, I, I, I couldn't figure out anything. I was like, well, I can't find them whether they're alive or not. Find a grave, all that stuff accounts for the families fantastically. I did find out that all the Julians moved away from Marysville, about 60s, 70s. They had, uh, all of them died of natural causes for most of them. They all lived in their 80s, 70s, 80s, all had good lives, things like that. But the only one that was missing was this, Rex, blank, blank, cause of death, blank, cause of death. All right, well, maybe that's something to think about, but I can't find any information on this Rex guy. So that's what's going to go on. And it doesn't matter if I can't find the family. And then, boy, it was, it was really a short time. I was down, I remember because I was downtown in the post office and I get a phone call. And people don't call me <laughs> very much. And it was Marilyn. And Marilyn Melton, the ones whose dogs I had, had called me as a courtesy because the house had been dark for the last couple of days. There was some snowstorm. I'm driving a 98 Lincoln town car, and I'm not seeing Marysville for a couple more days. And she called to make sure that I was okay. And, oh, yeah, Marilyn, I'm just staying down here. And then it was like an epiphany. I remember something that she mentioned to me long ago about her knowing somebody in the greenhouse up the street. The house now and hey Marilyn, that's right. Are you? Do you know anybody in that greenhouse? Oh yeah, I I knew the Julians. Uh, one of them was my best friend. Holy moly! Well, blah blah blah. I told her about this. Oh, I still talk to. I I really feel bad because I didn't get this lady's name. I wanted to protect her identity, but to the best of my knowledge, she's a great great granddaughter of of David Julian. Uh, in my guess, she was in her 80s maybe mid-80s or something, by the time I finally was able to meet her. But Marilyn talked to me, hey, I know the family, I know her. Fantastic, I, they need to get this stuff back. She would love it back. So I grab everything together. See, I want to do this right in sequence. I grab everything together, all, all the um, documents and things, 
I had a phone call with her, that's right, because I still have possession of this map, and I told her, explained to her thing. I did not talk about the nobody's sweetheart now, didn't even mention that, because nobody could even figure out what it was. I have these receipts, I have this, I have this cool map, I have, uh, you know, this advertisement. Oh, you can keep all that stuff. Just give me back the family stuff. Okay, so that's why I have that. Stop. Talk about being haunted. Um, so, I've, that's right. Because of logistics, and, and Marilyn knows this lady very well. Marilyn, can I give you this paper, these papers and you can get them back to her? Fine, that would be great. All right, cool. So I get a big giant Ziploc bag and jam them all in there. And I'm, Marilyn's house is about three blocks away or something. I'm walking out, and this house, oh yeah, the house, it's not on the photo, but there's a huge garage in there. Garage was used from a woodshed for decades. Tons of stuff in there. It was a garage sale that exploded when I moved in, just all abandoned stuff. All kinds of wood piles, trash piles, debris piles. I'd been in there for three months now, and I had already piled my stuff in there. Grab my stuff, <clears throat> walking by the garage, and as I recall, my memory was, oh, you better get your sunglasses or something, snow and everything. I walk in there and I grab, go in the car, grab my sunglasses, I'm walking out, there's a door, and still, I swear this is exactly how it happened. I've thought about this so, you know when you put a uh, cap back on the toothpaste, you're not thinking about it. It's something you automatically do. You walk by, you see a light off, you turn off the light switch or something like that. You're not even thinking about it. I'm walking by, there's this big pile of debris, de wood, chips, things like that. Oh, it's, I pick up this hunk of wood. What the hell did I do that for? I'm, I'm in the middle of carrying, what, what did I do that for? Turn the thing over, and this is what we see. And I had never seen it before. I had never seen it before. Camera phone photo, sorry. L. E. Julian, Silver City, Montana. What this was was a shipping crate piece of his Silver City store from the 1880s. That was the biggest treasure that the family wanted back. When they saw that, she was quote unquote over the moon, broke down crying because here's an actual physical artifact from their family, and they didn't have anything from Silver City. How did they get this? I'm walking out of the garage and Something took control of me like a joystick and grabbed it because there's no other explanation. You can say what you want about our brains are maybe bigger than what we think they are. I have demonstrated they're not for me. Like maybe I saw that and with Julian's it calculated and I knew it was there, so psychologically I. Gr <laughs> no. So that scared the hell out of me. So this shows, it shows almost like some kind of intelligent design versus a haunting, versus a lingering thing. Because when you look at this, I'll complete the story, we'll get to that. All right, the no, the no sweetheart now. All right, I talked to, the, talked to the family and there's nobody to suggest that there's a haunting there. There was no documented tragedy there. Their daughter Nellie died in the 18, early 1900s at 12 of diphtheria. She was buried in the, in the Marysville Cemetery, but then later was brought down to Forest Vale with everybody else. And there's something about it. It didn't feel right that it was a 12-year-old girl. She lived long enough to die in the hands of her family and have the loving embrace of them. Just something about it. I don't have any reason for it. Nellie, 12, nah, that all. But nothing else is here. So, oh, well, it's just another mystery. That summer, I got to meet the granddaughter. She came up to thank me for the papers, things like that. And let me see if I can get this straight here how it happened. She comes over to the house to see the house after a while, and I'm showing it to her, and then I ask her about this note, but I didn't ask her exactly what it was. I said, oh, by the way, there was a, by this time we'd figured out it was nobody's sweetheart now. Before, we couldn't figure out what it was. Therefore, I didn't ask her about it. I said, I found this other thing. I, it looked like someone jammed it on a, on a piece of paper. Uh, it seems to indicate, was someone having romantic trouble? A woman could have done that. Well, you don't know, but it, 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 that's what got in our head. Obviously, someone's having romantic trouble. 
And she said, no, I, I can't remember anything like that. And then I asked her about, oh, this Rex guy. I see he's not in there. Can I ask him about that because I have you here? Oh, yes, Rex. Um, he died in the, in the 60s he, when he was a teenager. Uh, he, got, he was one of the first people, teenagers, to get a car up in Marysville and did donuts in the parking lot, according to some residents, and drove it like a madman in some, and he got in a horrible car accident. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to pry on that, but I just wanted to get all the information. It has nothing to do with haunting the Julian house. Why uh, uh, he died in a, in a hospital or out on a highway or something. And then I said, oh, by the way, and then I asked her again about, it was then that I asked her about the, did somebody have some kind of uh, romantic problem? And she said, oh, no, that was Rex. She didn't change the subject after all. Right after his auto accident, the auto accident didn't kill him, but it gave him some chest injuries. None of them were specified, but the lady described how her, his chest was so messed up, and he was absolutely in love with this girl at the time. He was going to marry her, but he thought because of the accident, he could never anymore be anybody's sweetheart. She said that word for word, and that's why he shot himself in the house. And, you know, again, real people's lives. Sounds good for a ghost story, but boy, that just brought us. And then I asked her about it, but what was interesting is she looked at the note, too, and she brushed it off. She said, oh, maybe or anything. I think she's really good with whatever happened in her life, and she doesn't really want to drag that off. Because if she, she it was like throwing away a candy wrap. Ah, oh, it could have been or something like that. But I think differently. If you look at this from a, if you're writing it or if it's a story, you have the papers that are, you have this mirror that obviously is what? Well, first the poltergeist is trying to get your attention, right? If you're thinking of this in theory. And then you have the mirror. What's the mirror doing? Hey, I got these documents over here I want you to see. Who cares about the shoe sole or anything? But maybe it was Rex. Maybe he wanted that note found. Whether it's meaningful now, whether it means anything to him or anything. Why did he, he perhaps wanted that note found and that's why he, he did that. The house was sold six months after that. After that too, I lived there for six months and there was no hint at anything. There was no hint that there was outrage at the transgression of finding this. There was no anything else to accept that it was okay. But if you look at it logically, it was almost like a written. Got this stuff hidden. Need your attention. Somebody enough that will drag this mirror off. And then when it came down to grabbing this, this here, I don't know. If someone else can explain it better, I'm willing to do it. Because this seemed like something actually intervened. And if this is really true, I guess my own brain doesn't mean anything. But can you imagine if you could take control of somebody for even like, Eight seconds, 20 seconds? I always wonder, well, ghosts, what are they going to do for you? They're not going to kill you or anything, but what if they can make it turn the wheel or something like that? Okay, we're getting, getting to the end here. Let me wrap up here because uh, I want to take any questions that you might have. It. I got a time of, of 2.20, so that's about there. What I wanted to end up with is, let's see, I think I wanted, I really would like to throw some more Marysville stories at you. But there's a book out there, which would be good. I want to give more of these presentations, too, that is. I didn't even bother printing too much. This is the look of it. It's the same Haunted, um, haunted uh, America series. Ellen Balmer, she was very helpful in helping me get this as well. I owe her a big debt. They have all her books in there. And it's on Amazon and all that. It doesn't come out until April 27th. But if you're interested, you can do it. I'm more interested in talking to you and hearing about this. And maybe this might be a stepping stone to resolving some continuing mysteries. Let me wrap up, too, that this is... I only told you a couple stories about Marysville, too, without giving all of them. This is the biggest one here. But there are forces at work up there. This is only a fraction of what I was even able to include. I had a 40,000-word limit. Ah, gotta cut this, gotta cut this, gotta cut this, gotta cut this. Uh, Marysville House, I'll throw that at you. They think that Marysville House might be haunted. They've heard some things. Da, da, da. Chris Boyles. Did I get his right up without this? Chris Boyles and Chris Coyles and all that. Chris Boyles, he's a uh, bartender, and I come to know him, and I trust this guy too. 
This is a really quick story, and they've had a lot of candle, candle things flying out from the, from the tables. That's what I heard all a lot of time. Well, he's in there bartending. It's toward the end of the night, but they're still open. Uh, regular bar, bar, people sitting there. It's an L. We got a guy named, I hear, Roger, who lives in Silver City, if you're out there. That's apparently the witness. Chris is the bartender sitting back there. He's not doing anything time. He's just talking to Roger. And then they got rows of liquor bottles here, four liquor bottles. First row, second row, a little sign high. They watch this bottle levitate up high enough so it can get past the first row, over, turn, and fall. And they're looking at each other. Did you see that? I think I saw that. And it happened like twice to them. I think it might, that might have happened twice to two bottles. Uh, when all this came up, I got to know Troy Shockley at KCAP, and he had a bunch of people who came up to do an investigation up there. And we went into a bunch of other the houses and things, and there was some weird stuff happening that I don't have time. I just want to emphasize that this is just a fraction. This is just a fraction of what I know. This is just a fraction of what I'm still digging up. So I want keep in touch, keep your eyes open and everything. I'm going to try to put as much of this out on the web and everything and maybe get some uh, answers to some of these mysteries because this is just a touch. All right, let me, let me end on a positive note here before I ask for any questions and let you find people free. I said that it, things got weird when I got to Montana, really weird, and they did when it comes to the paranormal. But when you talk about God, when you talk about other forces at work, there are definitely other things here, and I want us all to embrace. This is, this is the day I knew that we didn't know what was going on. In fact, favorite Einstein quote, there's something deeply hidden behind all things. Einstein said that. I can't believe it. And he wasn't talking about quantum mechanics. Lindbergh, do you know Lindbergh? He had an out-of-body experience. He's discussed talking to spirits left and right on his uh, solo journey halfway through. You don't hear about that too much. Okay, I'm... Before I come back to Montana, move back, I was working in an emergency room, Olathe Medical Center, Olathe, Kansas, suburb of Kansas City. Um, I'm working in the emergency room in the desk, and um, we have the radios. Everything like you might see on TV is a big trauma center, too. So we had the radio to talk to the fire department and the ambulance, and boom, they get a call for a uh, female drowning victim. Uh, the girl was 12 years old, 13 maybe at the most. I can't gauge about 12 years old, 12-year-old uh, drowning. This was during the summertime. So uh, the story was is that mom went out to the backyard pool and found her daughter at the bottom of the pool. You can imagine. She dives in, grabs him up, starts screaming, calls the police immediately. There's a police officer who lives next door. Here's the ruckus, jumps over there. So you got two people, and she was trained, two people trained to give CPR. Again, it was in the summertime, too, so there's a a phenomenon called the diving reflex, that when it's cold, you can really survive. Last Breath on Netflix. Check that out. That's freaky as heck. Okay, so we're listening to this on the radio, just like you'd see on the TV. Okay, we're at the scene, and uh, all right, uh, uh, unknown number of time that the subject's been on there, and if you don't find somebody in three, four minutes, it's already, so she, she probably was already gone. Her pupils were not responding where you see that little thing. Uh, I used to be an EMT a long time ago, but as I understand it, pupillary response is basic. It's switch or not. If you don't have pupillary response, unless you're really, really anesthetized, that means your brainstem is dead. There's no two ways about it. If you open up a jar of pickles, the jar's open or not. There's no difference. If you're either pregnant or you're not, that kind of thing. And that's well known. Uh, so we're listening to no response, no people, so she's already gone. But of course, she's a 12-year-old, so they, we do everything we can. They do everything we can when I'm on the, on the phone. And they're in the scene for about 20 minutes. If you're not resuscitated within the first five, forget it. They might get your body back going, but there's going to be brain damage. There's going to be organ damage. I've seen four or five resuscitations in my life. None of them came out well. And this is in trauma centers where you have the full support. So we're listening to this horrible, horrible story of this drain. Give her adrenaline. They're giving her adrenaline in the heart. And they're doing massive level seven stuff. And all right, we're going to bring her in. All right, so we set up. And well, 40 minutes now. They come in. Here comes the ambulance. Here comes mom. 
My duty, lovely, not like I have a problem with it, is holding mom and taking her to the quiet room where they wait to find out whether their loved ones are going to live or not. Here's the priest saying in there. And I see, it, here they come in. They're, it's not working, but they're trying it. They bring her into, the trauma rooms were busy at the time, so she's in a bed in a big room with one of the curtain deals like that. So I'm here, I'm working, and I, I called everybody. There's nothing I can do. I'm just listening to this, and it's just horrible, horrible. Imagine the, pan, the family. Dr. Carlin, he's a good dude. Here he goes, Vince, go get the mother. In the past, that's been, hi, Mom, come over here so you can hold your baby for the last time. Or you can see all this resuscitation stuff so you can live with the fact that everything was done, even though it was hopeless by the time they found her. And this is a given stuff. Go up, get the mom over there, and I start bringing over the curtain. I'm holding her up, and you can, she can barely see. Holding it up, little girl sitting up in bed. Mama, mama, mommy, mommy, they embrace. And I had only been, I had one in EMT in the time. I didn't know it. I was like, oh, right on, boy, they saved her. And then I noticed that, that here's the nurses putting away their crash, and they're looking at each other. And you can tell, you work with these people, you know, I don't miss anything. Oh, who cares? I, I miss them. I don't care. And once everything is all settled down and stuff, and then I ask, Dr. Carlin, Dr. Carlin, that's great. You saved her. God, that was fantastic. And he says, had nothing to do with us and goes away. That's impossible. It was impossible, but I witnessed it and other people did. So embrace what's out there. If it's strange, it might all be connected. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Does anybody have... I must mention, too, if you have any questions or anything or, or want to give me any information or you want to complain or anything... I set up a Gmail account, hauntedmarysville at gmail.com. Very simple, easy to remember. Send it there, there. I really do thank everybody for coming. And if anybody does have questions, I'm, I'm well, going yeah, right. to repeat them for the recording. Um, so anybody have questions, comments? I think that's a good sign. <laughs> now, what are you talking about? Or, hey, no, I knew them. They didn't have anything to do with that. All right. Well, I'm sure Vince would also be answering your questions one on one if you want to come up and visit afterwards. So thank you very much and thank you, Vince. Thank you. Hey. This is one of these bucket.